member. Uh, some things to remember for today. This is a Zoom webinar. So all your videos and sounds are turned off. And uh, we would like you to set your Zoom in a gallery setting mode. So you could see all the participants, not all the, sorry, all the speakers and the panelists. Please do take advantage of breaks. All times are indicated in US standard time. And if you are on Twitter, if you could tweet, our hashtag is hashtag ICTR dash DI20. Again, that's hashtag or pound ICTR dash DI dot DI20. Those who stay for the whole day will be entered in a drawing to receive a one hour consult with Laura Dam Schroeder or Byron uh, Powell, who are our guest speakers today. They, these will be announced in two weeks. There is a whole crew of volunteers that is making this webinar possible, and I'd like to thank them. Um, if you if you are um, have questions or need to communicate with us, please use our conference code and menti at eight two five eight five four. And in a second, I'll, we will practice using Menti, but I want to go over the agenda for today. After me, um, we will have Dr. Jane Mahoney introduce you and welcome you to the short course. Then we will turn it over to Laura Dam Schroeder, who's going to um, talk about C4. And then we'll have a short break. After that, we will have our panelists. Um, and then we will adjourn at lunchtime the, and start the afternoon session uh, at 1.30 p.m. Central Standard Time in the US. Uh, you should have gotten links to these uh, individualized afternoon session and check your emails for those. Okay, let's practice Menti. If you could go on to Menti and start Putting, oh, there we go. We have people from Togo. We have people from Pennsylvania, Rochester, welcome. Wisconsin, welcome. Boston, Massachusetts. Alberta, welcome. Very snowy. Um, New York, welcome. Connecticut, welcome. Louisiana, welcome. Dallas, Texas, welcome. Connecticut, welcome. Variety of weather, UK, welcome. Canada, oh, cold and blue. Welcome, UK is saying gray. Rochester saying New York, uh, Rochester saying rain. Ontario, Ghana, very sunny, very jealous, welcome. Texas, sunny and cool, welcome. Argentina, welcome. South Africa, welcome. Rwanda, breezy, welcome. Massachusetts, welcome. Nova Scotia, welcome. London, welcome. Pennsylvania, welcome. California, welcome. Calgary, oh wow, 12 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, you are the coldest place right now. Welcome. All right, we will do this for 10 more seconds and then we will carry on with our presentation. Again, if you have any questions, please continue to use this uh, Menti function. It seems that you all have a very good, um, Hang off it. Ireland, welcome. Maryland, welcome. Netherlands, welcome. Iowa, welcome. Ireland, welcome. All right. That is awesome. So far, we have a few hundred people that have joined us. 
So I'm going to go to the next slide right now. And with this, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Jane Mahoney. She is our geriatrician and our fearless leader in DNI Launchpad. And I'm going to turn it over to her. Um, Dr. Jane Mahoney, the screen is all. Hi, greetings. Um, sorry about that. I'm Dr. Jane Mahoney and I'm the director of the uh, DNI Launchpad and um, faculty member at the University of Wisconsin Madison. I'd like to introduce you to our DNI Launchpad team. Um, we, um, it's an outstanding team. They've been working nonstop behind the scenes to pull this together and we'll continue to work throughout the day. Uh, Sheena Hirschfield is a marketing and communication specialist and um, myself, Rachel Moline, who is our research administrative specialist, Andrew Kwanbeck, our other DNI faculty member, Felice Resnick, assistant scientist with the Launchpad, and then you've met Mandira Saha Muldowney, who's our program manager already. So uh, what is the DNI Launchpad? We are a resource at the University of Wisconsin's CTSA Clinical and Translational Science Awards program. And we provide um, education, including this short course, um, other workshops and in, uh, design for dissemination tools. We also provide research consultation around grants um, projects and manuscripts and uh, feature of, we provide implementation support to help get interventions scaled up into practice through an evidence to implementation award for UW faculty and other members of uh, the ICTER, our uh, CTSA at University of Wisconsin. Uh, we provide toolkits and other materials to help with scale up. So um, our faculty members, myself and Andrew Kwanbeck, also are, are leaders within the CTSA uh, National Working Group for Dissemination and Implementation. Next slide. So I'd like to just say thank you to all our staff and volunteers, a special recognition to David Server, um, Amy and Brian, and again, the entire DNI Launchpad team and there's also many others behind the scenes that are helping us out here. So thanks. I want to tell you a little about the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I'd recommend coming here, not necessarily now, because as we mentioned, the temperature is um, a chilly 33 degrees Fahrenheit outside. But um, it's a wonderful place to visit. And if you like winter, it's wonderful in the winter. So the UW-Madison was founded in 1848. We have 45,000 students, 22,000 faculty and staff, 13 schools and colleges within the UW-Madison. And this photograph shows the UW-Madison, which is located right here in the, the isthmus between two lakes. We are ranked sixth nationally in research expenditures, um, 7,000 bachelors, and 3,700 masters and doctorates awarded annually, 41 Pulitzer Prize. My personal favorite is that we rank number one, and this is pretty consistent in uh, Peace Corps volunteers coming from a uh, university. We're also ranked number one in producing the most Fortune 500 CEOs, and we have uh, the dubious distinction of ha having classes canceled in 2019 due to minus 40 degree Fahrenheit weather. We are a part of the UW Institute for Clinical and Translational Research. And the goal of the Institute for Clinical and Translational Research is to create an environment that transforms research into a continuum 
from investigation through discovery and translation into practice to result in practical improvements in human health. We, the um, Institute for Clinical and Translational Research partners with uh, a number of UW-Madison schools, the College of Engineering, and uh, with Marshfield Clinic. And it's supported by the National Institute for Health, the Wisconsin Partnership Program, and UW Health. So I'd like to just feature our dissemination implementation short course attendees for this, our ninth year of the short course, 426 attendees from 24 countries, 33 states. Welcome to all of you and welcome in particular to those where you're facing challenges around uh, time zones and um, uh, sleep-wake cycles. So 82% of our participants are attending for the first time and we hope and believe that this will be a wonderful uh, first time introduction while also still having challenges, uh, presenting challenges for those who rate themselves as intermediate or advanced in DNI research skills. Most of our participants are from academic institutions, but 15% um, from hospitals and clinics, as well as nonprofits, government, and policy organizations. Next slide. This map shows where we come from. And um, welcome, welcome to all the continents and the countries that are represented. And um, we really appreciate being able to have uh, a global attendance. None of us appreciate um, COVID-19, of course, but doing this short course virtually has provided opportunities to share this learning around the world. Next slide. So I'll start with our definition of implementation research, which is the NIH definition. It's the scientific study of the use of strategies to adopt and integrate evidence-based health interventions into clinical and community settings in order to improve patient outcomes and benefit the health of the population. Our objectives for this course are to use the CIFR framework as well as other frameworks to assess context in implementation research and determine core components. Number two is to use and contextualize implementation strategies and identify discrete components in a synergistic way. And number three is how, learning how to identify strategies to address contextual barriers. So putting together context and strategies to address barriers and enhance implementation. So just as a reminder, we'd like this conference to be as interactive as possible. Um, you should use the mentee or the chat feature to ask your questions and provide your thoughts. We'll have multiple opportunities for uh, discussion throughout the day. And we will also have a um, featured session on day three where we tee up any questions that uh, we weren't able to get through, get to through the first two days. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our first uh, speaker and guest faculty for our short course, Laura Damschroeder. So Laura is um, an, an internationally known implementation researcher who is um, really at the head of advancing and applying implementation theories. And in particular, she is the lead developer of the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research which is one of the most widely used frameworks in implementation science. She's a full-time investigator with the Veterans Affairs Cl Center for Clinical Management Research in Ann Arbor, Mich Michigan, and an adjunct professor at uh, the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane. She uh, collaborates on many publicly funded research projects through her organization, Implementation Pathways. She's led national work, workshops and has been a mentor for many early career implementation researchers. So we are very excited to have her here to introduce us, introduce us to CIFR and to um, assessing context in thinking about implementation. And she will be um, speaking throughout the three days. 
Next slide. So we will turn now to our um, Laura. And uh, Laura, you can share your screen and present your slides for the first panel. All right, so while I am getting set up here, I will um, encourage please everyone um, uh, enter questions, enter reflections into Mentee. Um, trying to get the screens correct here, hang on. Uh, into Mentee so that we can use that as kind of a launch point for um, our discussion at the end and with, a, with the panel. Um, so I want to just ask, I think I may be sharing the wrong screen. Hang on, I'm trying to get into slideshow mode here. Um, all right, so I think I'm sharing the notes version. Is that correct? Can someone give me some feedback? That is correct. Click the button on the top left. This is display settings. Yeah, okay, how about that? Excellent. All right, thank you, Felice. The woman who is uh, the glue that is really kind of bringing all of these strands together with um, just the wonderful Launchpad team at University of Wisconsin. Um, and just thank you, they have been such a delight to work with um, through this process. Um, so I am going to kick off by talking about a practical application of an implementation framework, um, looking at data collection and analysis, um, focusing, as Jane said, on the CIFR, the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, which is a determinate framework, and I'll uh, explain that in a few minutes, um, but really focused on helping us to understand context in all of its complex glory and challenge. Um, and uh, anyway, this is a starting point. And all of the principles that I talk about here around the CIFR apply to any determinant framework. And uh, so I, of course, am most familiar with the CIFR, so that's what I'm going to talk about. But there are many other robust frameworks as well. For example, the Paris framework is one um, that is used quite often. And sometimes we use frameworks in combination with one another. Uh, for example, uh, uh, integrating in the theoretical domains framework, which brings in more detailed consideration of individuals. So as implementation researchers, we embrace complexity and there are a lot of implications to that. Um, we are not operating typically in a highly controlled randomized control trial type setting or scenario. And uh, so therefore we really have to consider intervention complexity, um, the fact that there are multiple components to most of the interventions that we're attempting to implement. Sometimes the boundaries are quite fuzzy between the intervention itself and the context within which it's being implemented, and they may change and shift over time. There's com a contextual complexity with dynamic multi-dimensional environments, dynamic meaning that they change over time, even though our assessments end up being kind of snapshots in time. Um, and there's implementation complexity, which Byron will talk about more tomorrow in terms of multi-component, multi-level strategies and how to select those, tailor them, adapt them, choose them then based on our knowledge and understanding of context in which the implementation is occurring. Um, we will touch on these first three kind of levels or types or facets of complexity, but we also need to recognize that there are complexities related to the pathways within which we're working. Um, there are feedback loop loops that are predictable and maybe unpredictable, mediators, moderators, multiply uh, interacting with one another. And there are also population complexity. Um, 
uh, really focusing on multiple patient groups and we're often attempting to apply in a more practical way to other um, populations or related populations that may not exactly be the same or meet the same eligibility criteria as were uh, laid out in uh, foundational RCTs or randomized control trials. So theory and uh, often encapsulated by frameworks is enormously important, um, really in any scientific endeavor, but I would posit that they're especially important within implementation research because they provide an organizing framework within all of these kind of facets of complexity that I covered. Um, they provide a harmonized language just at their kind of most fundamental level, the way that we uh, uh, the lens that we bring to the work that we're doing is encapsulated within these frameworks. They provide a list or a set of common terms and definitions and really a way of looking at the world. Um, there's, there are multiple ways of looking at the world. There is not one right way, um, but the beauty of kind of the broad international worldwide scientific community is that we're all bringing different lenses into our work. And again, the CIFR as a framework is one way of looking at the world, um, but there are many other ways as well. But regardless of the framework you use, really um, an important theme coming out of my talk this morning is the importance of applying the framework meaningfully into and integrating it into the bones of the research that you're doing, meaning that it is guiding all phases of your research. Um, and when you do this, it really helps to build the scientific knowledge base, um, giving us better, deeper understanding of context, of mechanisms of action. It allows us to generalize across multiple studies um, using the uh, framework because it provides this common language and constructs or variables um, across multiple studies. So your work, I can learn from your work and you can learn from my work when we are speaking the same scientific language, which then of course um, helps synthesis. It makes it easier to synthesize knowledge um, even if the work is, is wholly qualitative or mixed methods, which are um, two kind of methodological approaches that are often used within implementation science because of the complexities. Um, and it then provides the use of theory, provides an efficient way then to systematically build collective knowledge. So Pierre Nielsen wrote a wonderful paper that really kind of helped to encapsulate or describe um, where this field of implementation science is going in terms of, you know, how do we, how do we talk about theories, models, and frameworks? And I'll say that there's, I could give a whole talk about kind of the conflation between these terms and um, sometimes people use kind of theory and frameworks anonymously, um, but I will just quickly say that a framework, a conceptual or a theoretical framework, which is where I'm going to focus um, today, is really one level of theory, one way of encapsulating theories that actually is a quite loose um, depiction versus a very specific model that, that is testable statistically. Um, so uh, last year I published a paper called Clarity Out of Chaos and it really is taking um, Nielsen's uh, categories a step further and really looking and laying out um, within implementation science, we have what I kind of call an overarching or a meta hypothesis that, you know, when we are translating or implementing evidence-based innovations into routine practice out in the real world, a, apart from just a, a, a research clinical trial, um, we need to have and specify an implementation approach and uh, implementation outcomes and monitor those in order to and have a successful, effective implementation process 
so that, and an effective evidence-based innovation, innovation. And those two together then will have impact on health systems and clinical outcomes. And of course, ultimately um, improving the lives and well-being and health of patients. So uh, process frameworks are frameworks that guide the process of implementation and it helps to identify or begin to give kind of a lens into mechanisms of change. So this is kind of the active component of implementation of um, the implementation approach. Evaluation frameworks are um, really help to delineate and specify what are the outcomes that are important. And the REAIM framework does more than specify outcomes, but it is a really valuable framework for, and it was a, a very valuable and important contribution within implementation science because it opened the door to multiple levels of outcomes. For example, not just considering effectiveness of the innovation itself, but also considering, are you reaching the patients that can benefit from the program? Are they representative issues of equity? Um, and then outcomes related specifically to implementation and then whether or not we can uh, uh, um, maintain and sustain those over time. So then all of these approaches, all of these theories, we have to recognize that there are variations and in dynamics related to the individuals involved. Um, and, the, and these individuals are all embedded within inner setting or within their organization, within their clinics, within their communities. And this is really where kind of the dynamics of context arise. And then those inner settings, those communities, those clinics are embedded themselves within um, the outer setting um, and uh, within the outer setting. So the determinant frameworks of which, of which CIFR is um, a determinant framework, um, these uh, um, provide a list of factors that help us to understand and um, identify kind of moderators or influencers on implementation efforts. So I'm going to focus um, on determinant frameworks. And as I said earlier, um, the CIFR is one example. So I wanna give a, a shout out to the work of Sarah Birkin and colleagues and um, Byron was a part of this work as well and others, um, but really looking at how do people choose a framework to apply to their work? And uh, a tool called the TCAS tool was developed and, um, and there is a link, I provide the link here within the slides. I think you have access to these slides. And um, we also have a link to this tool within the CIFR guide website as well. Um, there is a question from the chat. Your um, PowerPoint uh, went out of presentation mode. Uh, okay. I was trying to look at chat at the same time. So um, I guess you're going to have to shout at me like you just did, Jane, if there's anything, um, there if anything comes it's up. Bad. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Thank you for saying something. So when we think about evidence-based innovations, you know, ultimately, of course, the goal with these innovations is to improve patient care or more broadly to improve the well-being and health of human beings. These innovations have active ingredients or components that contribute toward those key outcomes. And an important um, facet of these innovations is the ability to adapt them to context. Um, within implementation or within the, the RCT world or the intervention trial world, establishing internal validity is a priority. So to the extent possible, all of these kind of pesky, complicated contextual variables are, are stripped out as much of po as possible. They're either controlled or I would, uh, I would say that they're ignored. Um, but in implementation, when we, when we talk about implementation, we can't afford to do that. But coming out of RCTs, randomized control trials, these interventions tend not to have 
um, a pragmatic or detailed description of the components. Often we have kind of a high level description of the components, but not enough detail that, that like providers in a clinic really need to discern whether or not this um, is an inner innovation that can work well in their clinic. There are not guide, there is not guidance available for how to adapt or tailor those innovations or how to implement. So for example, and this really contributes to our persistent gap in knowledge and gaps in translations. So if you were to, and I can challenge you even to this day, um, if you look at a Cochrane review of a behavioral or multi-component um, innovation, of some sort, they will. There will be a conclusion. I can almost, I, you know, I'll bet you, um, where uh, that what the conclusion will say something along the lines that findings revealed limited information about, and then it will go on um, about the particulars of the innovation. But it's usually around things like, well, what are the attributes of successful versus unsuccessful um, in this case team initiatives. Um, what are the barriers and facilitators to that affect the effectiveness? Um, and what are the unique and combined contributions of components of the intervention? And how do we establish um, the necessary kind of teams in this case with the quality and safety teams? Um, so then, and then there's a call that further research is needed to really understand the hows and the whys um, so again, coming out of randomized clinical trials, um, they are usually conducted with a high degree of internal validity and they tell us what works so that the innovation in this particular scenario um, is effective. And there, this uh, focus on internal validity really is concerned with establishing the causal pathway. Was it really this intervention? that caused the outcomes that we're observing. As implementation researchers, we are very concerned or we put our uh, more of a focus on external validity. We need to answer the question of what works where, why, and how. And so we focus on transferability and generalizability from a highly controlled setting to a much less or no controlled setting. So um, applying theory in implementation. One of the first steps is to understand, you know, assuming that we have an intervention that is um, targeted to address a gap in care, we need to assess targeted the uh, context within which that innovation will be implemented. And we can use theory, a determinant framework like the CIFR to do so. So I'm going to walk through a, um, a case. Uh, this is based on a paper that was published in, uh, uh, that is published. I think I have the reference here somewhere, but if I don't, I will provide it. But this is an implementation um, study of the tele a, a Telephone Lifestyle Coaching Program, or TLC, within the VA. Um, this particular program provided telephone coaching um, to support lifestyle change on six different topics. Most people chose uh, weight uh, management or weight loss, um, striving for a healthy weight or to quit smoking. Veterans were provided up to 10 calls over a six month period of time. There's a strong evidence base for this program coming into this large scale pilot. Within the pilot, there were over 9,000 veterans referred over a 19 month period, over half of whom enrolled um, and a large, proportion, a large proportion completed at least seven or more. So there was a high degree of engagement. But what we found is that there, were, there, were, there was high variation in the number of referrals that were made to this TLC program. So um, in a way, you know, it seems like a fairly uh, simple effort that um, medical centers, that clinical staff needed to do to simply refer identify patients who would benefit from a program like that and then refer them to it. And the program itself, the coaching was being provided by an outside um, entity. But you can see on the right-hand side here that at month 19, that, it, uh, that there was a, a high degree of variation. In fact, the highest number of referrals or the highest rate of referrals was seven times higher than the lowest rate of referrals. 
So the question is, what were the barriers and facilitators to uh, implementation? We used the CFER to guide semi-structured interviews and we could conducted a total of 100, 100, 103 interviews over two different time points across 11 sites. We used a mixed methods approach. We had quantitative surveys and qualitative interviews, and we also relied on administrative data and field notes. And I'm not going to go into detail about this. That is provided in the paper, the published paper. Um, our outcome of interest was an operationalization of the of penetration, which is basically the referral rates that I showed you in the previous graph. So now our question is, well, who needs to do what differently and which barriers and facilitators need to be addressed? And using a framework like the CIFR, we can start to get insights to these questions. The CIFR or the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research is comprised of five domains and there are, it depends on how you count them, but um, 37 to 39 constructs um, that are organized across these five different domains that are conceptualized to uh, influence um, one another and influence um, implementation. So for example, the first domain is the intervention or innovation itself. This includes the evidence-based practice, the treatment, a program, um, whatever, it, whatever it is. Um, and because we did semi-structured interviews, I can show you example quotes that apply to or give us insight into the perceptions of the clinics or people within those clinics and what they were thinking about the TLC coaching program. So this particular person said, I was impressed with the evidence and I know from our own patients who have been successful from a similar program that this is likely to work. So there are multiple sources of evidence, both research evidence and local evidence, and that this person had a very positive perspective. Even though the evidence base was the same for TLC across all of the sites, there were very different. This was an example of, a, of someone who had a positive perception, but we also had examples where people had a negative perception of the evidence and they didn't think that it would work with their patients. Now, one of the things when we think about interventions is the idea that there are multiple components often comprising that intervention. And there is a, uh, at least the concept or the theory that there are core components and then there's an adaptable periphery. But like I said earlier, we don't get a lot of guidance coming out of RCTs about which are the active ingredients, which are like which are uh, those core components, and how do we adapt um, uh, you know the components to so that it fits within my clinic, within my setting. So just one example with a weight loss program that we um, that where we demonstrated effectiveness in a clinical trial called Aspire. We found that with higher fidelity coaching, so we had a very specific definition of what high fidelity means, we were able to demonstrate that there was more weight loss the higher uh, the coaching or the higher fidelity of coaching. In a subsequent study, um, which was more of a pragmatic um, test or trial of the diabetes prevention program, which is another lifestyle program focused on weight loss, um, we translated this uh, fidelity um, instrument that we use to assess fidelity into a very easy to apply within the clinic. And, um, and we were able to find again that higher fidelity led to higher satisfaction of participants, which then in turn led to higher participation and more weight loss. So in this way, when we're assessing specifically um, fidelity, um, we're able to kind of start to hone in on what are the active ingredients within uh, the intervention. And in this case, one of the active ingredients for sure is high fidelity coaching. So now I'm gonna talk about adaptations. Um, and this is a topic all in, <laughs> in, in and of itself. Um, I am highlighting the frame framework that can be used to track adaptations. And uh, again, this can be an entire hour, one hour talk in and of itself. As you can see, 
the complexities of this, but tracking, you know, when the adaptations were made, what are the adaptations that are needed, who will do those or, or participate in the decisions about adaptations, why are the adaptations being made, um, and there's a ton of wonderful research um, to help guide um, our thinking about adaptations. The next domain within the CIFR uh, framework are characteristics of the individuals themselves. So for example, um, someone at one of our TLC sites said, I've heard one physician say, oh, it doesn't work. They regain weight anyway. There were providers <clears throat> at some of our clinics that had held this belief. And those are kind of individual attitudes that can really cause resistance point, resistant points in our implementation efforts. The third domain are factors that are rooted within the outer setting, but they very much affect what happens within the clinic. So for example, within the VA, and I think this is true outside VA as well, that there are often quality metrics that need to be met. So this one person said, it helps to meet performance measures that nationally we need to meet. So when they're able to see the synergy of this new innovation and how it can help them meet their performance goals, that's a positive influence. But again, same program, same system, same performance goals overall. We also had people at other sites that had a negative they felt like this new program would compete with their, um, with their existing programs and would undermine their performance measurement. Who's right? Well, it may be a matter of perception and a matter of their particular context. The fourth domain is uh, of the inner setting. And this is where the, um, the highest or the greatest number of factors um, are, are listed within the framework. Um, one of the factors is the idea of compatibility. And here's a quote as an example that kind of highlights a positive perception of compatibility of this new program, where the person said, health coaching just fits right in with our disease prevention and health promotion pro programs, and it's such a compliment. Um, again, some people saw that, that this new program would fit well with their current um, you know, clinical process and others did not. Um, and you can imagine the positive versus negative influence that that can have on your efforts. The fifth domain is the process domain. The CIFR does not uh, specify how to do implementation, like step one, step two, step three. There are process frameworks, other process frameworks that do that. But we do know that there are key uh, facets of the implementation process itself that are very important to um, assess. So uh, really looking at the quality and the content of the process. So here's an example where a provider, a primary care provider said, I didn't even know that that was available to my patients. So this is showing us that, that the uh, implementers at this particular site did not necessarily do a great job of engaging providers that are the kind of bread and butter, the important source for referrals to the program. So this points out um, you know, a problem or a gap where um, more engagement is needed among those primary care providers. So all of these um, constructs. We are uh, available online and of course in our published papers, um, but if you go to seaforguide.org online, um, there is a ton of technical help um, for how to apply the CIFR um, to your own work. We have example memos. Um, one of the tools we have is how to create an interview guide based on the CIFR. We have what we call the interview guide maker where you can select your domain, you can select your constructs that you're interested in, and then questions. We have some sample questions as a starting point, and you can select those questions and then output a formatted uh, master interview guide. And then you can use these questions and probes uh, as a starting point and edit them within Word or you know, whatever document software you use. 
And this is a great thing to include with proposals. And um, when we publish our work, we, uh, whether it's protocol papers or whether it's uh, final output, we always include the interview guide in an appendix. So we have all this qualitative data to this point. And I know I'm talking very fast and just giving a, a, a high level overview. But um, the next step with this qualitative data that we often take in our work is to quantify that qualitative data. What we really want to get at is what is the strength and the valence of each of the constructs? So what that means is, is this particular construct as a whole within this clinic generally a positive influence or a negative influence? And how strong is that influence? It's almost like a like an impact uh, matrix that um, is often used within quality improvement um, spheres. So um, in this particular study, the analysts were blinded to site outcomes because we didn't want knowledge of the referral rates of sites to influence the ratings of each of the constructs for each clinic. Um, we have, again, we have guidelines for how to apply these quantitative ratings using qualitative data um, in our, on our website and also in our published papers. So here's an example of a negative rating. And this is just one passage among several that were at this one clinic. So at this one clinic, only providers, only uh, medical physicians could refer patients to TLC. And this was someone who said, our nurses are specifically forbidden to write orders and everything that gets written has to be written by a physician. And this has really formed a labor intensive situation for practitioners. What this means is that very busy primary care providers are going to tend not to refer patients because it takes too much time relative to all of the other treatment priorities that a physician has to deal with every day. Um, so in this case, we assigned a minus two that indicates a strong negative influence put, um, on implementation. And then here is a strong positive influence, an example, where at a different clinic, um, there was a, a positive perception of um, compatibility with their clinic. Um, here's one person who said that this really helps the patient to have ownership for their process and for their living, and it blends very nicely with the health coaching. And again, we don't rely just on a single quote, but this is just one example. And in this clinic, we assigned a strong positive influence of compatibility for this particular site. We are then able to take these ratings and apply them to a matrix that where we've got the sites listed across the top. So there, the, there's the facility ID. We then sorted from left to right from the lowest referral site to the highest referral site. And then we can see the individual ratings going from left to right. So here's an example of where they're generally negative, strongly negative on the left side and moving toward positives on the, on the right side. Um, and if we were to look at a single um, construct compatibility in this case, we can see that generally the ratings are going up over time. And then here's this kind of toothy diagram that shows it's not a perfect relationship, but with an N of 11, we have a correlation over 0.5. Um, even though the significance is marginal, but we can see that there, it qualitatively at least, that there is a trend. And so this, in this way, if we kind of take a step back and look at all of the constructs, the red arrows in this particular study are showing the seven constructs that seem to be related, or that, there's, that there's a strong enough signal that we can say are each independently affecting implementation and ultimately really independently affecting our outcome, which was the referral rates. So then when we list these, um, we list these constructs, we're able to describe what they look like in a high referral site versus a low referral site. 
using our qualitative data. So now we begin to have insights into why this highest referral site was seven, had seven times the rate of the lowest referral site. So I've talked a bit about intervention complexity in terms of what it takes to identify the active ingredient components or the most effective components, a little bit about adaptation. And I've also talked about how to use a framework to begin to bring clarity to the complexity of our contextual influences. And I want to um, remind you about the, um, this tool that um, really kind of helps you through a thought process in choosing a framework for your own work. Thank you. So we now have time for question and answer. And um, I'd like to see if there's any questions from Menti. There are. There have been some really interesting and wonderful questions that have come in from Menti. So the first question is for the CFER framework, it seems to be uh, from the perspective solely from implementers. Wait once. So sorry. My qu the question is for the CFER framework, is the perspective solely from the implementers, example, healthcare providers, or does it include end users' perspectives? such as patients as well? That is a great question. And that question is coming up more and more. And in our own work, we are really, uh, we're, we're integrating user-centered design principles and methods into our own work. Um, I will say that when, when the CIFR was first developed, it was very much from a health system perspective and what we call the stakeholders within the system. So that includes um, clinicians, it includes staff, it includes clinical leaders, executive leaders, anyone who is involved or influencing our implementation efforts to get a new program or other innovation in place. So yes, the, the focus has been um, on the organizational um, players, so to speak. But in the 10 years plus since the CIFR has been published, it has been applied to all kinds of settings and adapted um, for community intervention. So now we're talking about, um, for example, community health workers. Um, we're talking about uh, community centers and other kind of community uh, participants or, or citizens. Um, and then we're, we also need to focus on, on patients as well. And our perspective is that absolutely with the factors that may potentially influence our implementation efforts, patients definitely would have insights about many of the constructs that we define within the CIFR. One of the things that I do want to highlight though is that back in the earlier phase when we're establishing uh, the evidence base for an intervention. These are interventions that by their definition, by their focus and objective are designed to improve the health and well-being of patients. Most of the time, there are interventions that are targeted to change provider behavior, but ultimately, you know, maybe, uh, you know, as an indirect path or as like a, 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 a player in that pathway, but ultimately we want to improve the lives of patients. So our thinking in the early days were, oh, well, all the patient, you know, patient factors and acceptability, uh, you know, uh, by patients of the intervention, uh, their adherence or fidelity to the intervention, uh, the ways, you know, all the different ways they're using the intervention and all the benefits that they may experience as a result of the intervention, that that really is the work of trialing and testing and designing and creating the intervention itself. And so an assumption, for better or for worse, was that all their work would be done and then the work of that the CIFR was trying to inform was how do we get that wonderful intervention in place that will have all these positive, wonderful influences on patients. Um, but again, that said, 
I think it's important to include patients in consideration of, you know, how do we design implementation efforts so that the program can optimize and maximize benefits for patients. Really interesting. We also have uh, a couple more questions and this one's received a lot of upvotes. So I'm going to um, share it, make sure to upvote what you're interested in on Menti. How do you recommend prioritizing CIFR domains slash subdomains for qualitative interviews? For example, when you have limited time for interviews, such as 20 minutes only. Yep, great question. Um, we do have guidance on the website for how to do that because of course we don't have the latitude and the luxury to test all 37 or 30 plus uh, constructs in every study. Um, there are a number of ways that you can prioritize. Um, one is just based on theory. So if you have um, kind of a hypothesis or a testable model that includes specific variables and you want to um, uh, gather qualitative information, um, affirmation about those variables, um, that can help narrow down the constructs if you map those variables to the constructs within the CIFR. Another way to do this is based on your experience. Um, in our case, we do a lot of partnered work. And so on several of our studies, we've actually gone through kind of a pre-work process where we ask our, um, our uh, partners, our operational partners who have experience in the field of what it takes to implement these programs. And we'll ask them, what are the most important constructs? And when we go through that process, we're, it usually distills down to you know, maybe 10-ish uh, constructs. And you can, you can uh, get information um, on 10 constructs. Well, we usually have one hour interviews, but we've also done half hour interviews. Um, the other way just to you know, kind of get down and practical is that we find a lot of times the main person who will be or has been involved in implementation, those are the longer, richer interviews. And if we start with those, it gives us a lot of insight into what's going on at that setting. And the subsequent interviews were able to distill down um, much shorter based on those early interviews. The last way of honing in is just is looking at empirical evidence. Um, there are more and more studies, you know, actually hundreds of studies that have been published using the CIFR. And uh, we're doing, actually we're in the process of doing another uh, synthesis, but we do have a, pu a published synthesis that's showing the frequency of use of um, the constructs. They're not necessarily all uh, uh, significantly related to outcomes, but at least it gives you a starting point. Wonderful, and we have so many more questions and <laughs> loving all the upvotes. So I'm gonna have time for a couple of more. So um, Laura, can you discuss how the CIFR could be used to plan slash adapt an intervention for a particular context before implementation? Yes, well, that actually is a great segue question for what we'll get into tomorrow. Um, so absolutely, when we identify where the, the resistance points are likely to be within a, con within a context, um, there is a process that Byron will talk about tomorrow, um, and we'll also go into it on day three about how to um, match or choose and, and then adapt those implementation strategies based on your knowledge of construct or uh, context. So that's a great question. Stay tuned, come back, stay engaged, and then you'll find out. <laughs> Excellent. I, I love the preview. So... <laughs> Let's see, how, here's an interesting question. How can you incorporate an equity lens into the CIFR? That is a great question. And I'm actually um, actively involved in two different networks that are trying, of researchers who are trying to answer exactly that question. Um, I, I, I actually don't have a good answer for that. I have some thoughts. Um, you know, there's definitely, you know, one way to think about this is um, on the patient uh, side of the equation or side of the coin is making absolute sure it's our moral obligation 
to make certain that our implementation approaches do not exacerbate already existing equity issues. Better yet, we design our implementation approaches to dismantle racist systems or inequitable systems that are in place today. And exactly, I think that level of commitment by us as implementation scientists really requires us to be um, kind of self-reflexive and to look at um, systems through a whole new lens, I think, or an additional lens. So we are in the process of um, kind of thinking through that and developing that. But I think within the communities that, that I'm, a, that I'm uh, uh, engaging in dialogue with, um, I think that we all agree on those principles. Excellent. And I see that we just, we have so many questions in there. and we actually have a lot of time. So keep and asking and upvoting those questions and we'll get to as many as we can. So another question, could you please speak to using CIFR to identify anticipated slash expected barriers and facilitators to implementation of an evidence-based intervention, i.e. in pre-implementation phase? Do you have any examples you can speak to? In pre-implementation phase, um, we, so in the study that I gave an example of, we actually, um, it's partly, some of the information we gathered was concurrent to implementation. And then our second interview point was um, later in the implementation process. But we wanted to use this information to help inform prospectively future implementations. And so we actually use this information to create what we called a barrier buster tool that um, is really kind of a pithy um, distilled list of potential challenges that other um, clinics may encounter in implementing TLC, the, the telephone coaching program. And then we map those to specific strategies that our partner had available, for example, um, you know, if they're having trouble getting their physicians on board to refer patients to the lifestyle coaching program, um, we can say kind of broadly, oh, we need to educate providers or, you know, in some way change their behavior. Well, a, a kind of a multi-component strategy that is mapped to that issue um, included PowerPoint slides that were literally, you know, they're literally PowerPoint slides that you can download and um, present at primary care staff meetings um, to clinical leaders. Um, you can edit them, you know, for your, for your own clinic, for your own use. Um, and then as well, uh, there were uh, electronic health record um, note templates um, to help kind of walk through and ensure that physicians would address um, lifestyle uh, or weight, really kind of weight or obesity um, within their uh, clinical encounters. So that's one example. And I'm, I'm pretty confident that Byron is gonna go through more. I mean, there are all kinds of approaches that people use, including implementation mapping approaches based on intervention mapping, uh, work from um, uh, uh, Maria Fernandez and colleagues at University of Texas and as well as Byron and, and his group. Um, so you'll be hearing a lot more about that. Great. Um, so many excellent questions. Uh, so here's an interesting one. How do you deal with overlap between CIFR constructs and outcomes such as perceived acceptability of the intervention? You know, this taps into a really important point. Um, when people come to me about, well, how do I apply the CIFR, um, you know, within my study and here's what we're doing. Um, my kind of bottom line is, you know, what, brings clarity to your work. I mean, that that's an important kind of a, a gestalt of um, selecting a framework, selecting your measures, 
how these measures relate to one another. So when you're talking about conceptualizing perceived uh, acceptability, was that the one, you know, just as an example, is that an outcome or is that a determinant? Um, it really depends on what the lens is or what the, what the uh, goals are of your particular study. So I would say that a measure like perceived acceptability is a very proximal measure of um, that might be really useful pre-implementation. But then there may be another measure that is less proximal, but also clinically important like referral rates that is important to assess as implementation is occurring. So kind of as a progress measure and as um, a, a retrospective outcome. So that's kind of more of a system or intermediate outcome. And then of course, ultimately we wanna know in this particular scenario, have patients actually lost weight? That's an endpoint clinical outcome. So um, there, it is really important. And, and I get really excited about this because as implementation scientists, we have the latitude, we have the obligation actually of naming and considering multiple levels of outcomes because we have to provide, we have to develop a value proposition. And I'm finding this more and more pressure for me and my teams to develop value propositions. Um, and I think an important uh, strategy actually for engaging and building that re uh, receptivity and optimizing uh, implemented programs is to call out and recognize benefits to the employees that are involved you know, does it make their work easier? Does it bring more enjoyment? Does it empower them? Um, you know, there's a whole range of measures at that level. How about the system? Well, you know, hate to say cost cut, you know, cost savings are very important. Um, what's return on investment? You know, so there, there are measures at that level. And then there are measures that are kind of intermediate, more proximal measures like referral rates. And then there are measures that are um, clinic or you know, patient related, and that is weight loss and ultimately reduction of disease um, that results um, from obesity. So there are all these kind of stages of measures and different measures are important depending on the phase that you're in in implementation. Are you doing a diagnostic pre-implementation or are you um, looking at measures to assess your progress? Or are you at the end evaluating the sum total of everything you've done and accomplished over, I don't know, five years? So Laura, I have a, uh, I'm gonna tee up the next question for you. Um, this is a question about uh, sort of in comparison to the, another framework, iParis if you're familiar with that. And the question mm -hmm. is that th that framework includes both provider and patient individuals. So recipient provider and recipient patient and, and also encounter. And how do those relate to uh, the CIFR uh, framework or how does it address those? And by encounter, is that specifically patient and provider encounter? Um, it, it actually does not really say in the okay. question. So all right. that's all right. So first of all, um, the iParis framework, um, the CIFR drew on kind of principles or concepts from iParis um, in the early days. Well, it's still comprised of three domains, um, the evidence domain. So this is... Um, kind of the evidence, uh, you know, based not just on research evidence, but also evidence from patients or like my experience working with patients and also clinician experience. And then there's context and then there's uh, facilitation. So the iParis I have regarded as kind of a, a hybrid framework because it talks about facilitation as a necessary process 
to accomplish successful implementation, but then it also has all these determinant factors within. So the early days of the, of, the, of the Paris, this is kind of fun fact here, the early days of Paris, it preceded the CIFR, um, but we definitely resonated with it. It was, you know, had a lot of traction in the field at the time we were developing the CIFR. We drew on, uh, the Paris was one of like 19 frameworks that we included and considered within the CIFR. And then kind of fast forward to a few years ago where I, uh, Paris was updated to iParis that then drew a lot of information and uh, insights from the CIFR. So actually the iParis includes and incorporates a lot from the CIFR. So the two frameworks are very synergistic and really have leveraged off of one another, which is wonderful. Um, the iParis includes um, the patient in you know, several ways in terms of explicitly um, including them in assessments of evidence and effectiveness. Um, I'm not really familiar with how they uh, explicitly uh, draw on patient as a role or as a, um, you know, as a source of information for doing context assessment, but I can imagine them being involved in the facilitation process. Um, for example. Um, and again, I think that goes back to my earlier um, answer about uh, the CIFR recognizes the importance of providing patient-centered care, which our health systems are not terribly great at. There are, of course, pockets of excellence, but as a whole, we're not terribly good at being patient-centered because there's so many other priorities and pressures um, day to day, minute to minute. <laughs> um, but increasingly in our system and many systems, there are patient boards, advisory boards um, that are being uh, drawn on, you know, to gain knowledge and insights from uh, patient representatives. So that's one clear way to include the patient voice. Um, I think that, you know, when we consider uh, like uh, compatibility or fit. So I, I'm not a clinician, but if I were, I may have an opinion about, oh, this is great. Well, let's design it this way. Where the patient says, wait a minute, you're making me go over there and then over here, that's not compatible to my experience at all. So yeah. that's a great example of um, really the imperative to include patient voice. Thank you. And kind of building off of that, where there's so many things to focus on minute to minute, there's um, a question that I think just builds on really nicely, which is, is it best practice to investigate all factors slash constructs listed in the CIFR? If that isn't feasible, how do you prioritize what to focus on? Yeah, so that's similar to the earlier question of how mm -hmm. do we distill it down into short interviews and um, in a nutshell, I say, well, first of all, we've got guidance on the seaforguide.org website. And uh, one way is to be guided by your theory of change. The second is um, based on your own experience and your partners or other stakeholders that are actually working, actively working within the setting that you're going to be implementing within. And then the third way is empirical evidence. And there are syntheses out there that begin to kind of identify frequently occurring um, constructs. And there was something else I was gonna say about that. Um, oh, I know, a very important. Um, when we're collecting qualitative data mm -hmm. is to open up with a, a, a broad open-ended question. Tell me about your environment. You know, if it's pre-implementation for a particular intervention, tell me a story about a recent attempt to make a change. Uh, what was that? What were the challenges? Where were the, you know, so your, your ear, you know, once you start to internalize these um, concepts and, you know, so it does take time and learning, but you can code those open responses for constructs as well. And really when you focus your interview questions on specific constructs, you do that to make sure that you're consistently finding information about, for example, the idea of relative priority. 
How important is this relative to everything else going on? You wanna make sure you get that from everybody, but it may pop out and it often does pop out um, in that very first question. Um, or, you know, if you're, depending on when you're doing these interviews, you either focus it specifically on the intervention or at, um, at the other end of the scale, I guess, you at least get a feel for what the prior experiences has been and how they may flavor um, uh, the experience going forward. Um, I just wanna say that when we say, what do you think the issues are gonna be? People are terrible prognosticators, just terrible. Um, and so that's why, you know, it, it may not seem uh, logical to necessarily ask about history, um, but it can give really important, real insights into what things might be like going forward. Laura, I was gonna say also that as you begin the process that occurs on the bottom of that CIFR figure, that process then gives the opportunity for stakeholders as well to say, this is what I saw as a priority construct or issue. And different, the different individuals in the, in the inner setting may have different priorities. So it's really important to hear all those voices. Absolutely. And then the fun comes when you're trying to kind of amalgamate all those voices. And um, sometimes we find situations, for example, where you know, one profession like nurses have a very different and consistent perception, you know, versus physicians um, in primary care. And so those, those, that variation is really important not to lose. Um, but often we do find that for a lot of these constructs, there really is, um, they, they begin to kind of converge and triangulate. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to bring up what uh, one of the comments from uh, Maria Fernandez, I believe in the, in the chat is that in thinking about prioritizing constructs, briefly consider the importance of how strong is the association between the CIFR construct and the implementation outcome. And you talked about that, Laura, and then the feasibility of making a change in that construct with your implementation strategy. Right, and I love the, um, I, you know, that's really important, kind of the feasibility and impact um, and doing a feasibility impact matrix is a very common method that a lot of um, people are familiar with who work within quality improvement. And um, I kind of call it the low hanging fruit approach where, you know, where's the biggest bang for the effort or biggest bang for the buck that we can um, you know, in terms of helping us choose those strategies that are the easiest to do and the highest impact. So keeping that in mind, absolutely. Excellent. That's also a great question. So I know you've mentioned you're not a clinician, but there have been a lot of votes from people who are looking for examples for this work in clinical settings. Are there examples of this approach in, also in community-based interventions, which have increased in complexity? There's also questions about using it in community-based participatory research, kind of combining a lot together to see what you have uh, thoughts on. Yeah, so that is covering a lot of ground. Um, first of all, I would like to um, uh, suggest that we as implementation scientists must take fundamentally a participatory approach to our work. And whether it's participatory, you know, with community members or people within clinical settings, that spirit and that kind of um, approach and goal, I think is really key to our success. Um, we cannot do this alone. We cannot just be like a strike force coming in from above and <laughs> getting a new program implemented into a context without the willing participation and the engaged participation of people that are key within that context. And whether it's community, whether it's a clinic, whether it's an ICU within a hospital, um, whether it is at a state policy level, um, we 
have to uh, identify who the key, and, and I, I don't know, this sounds kind of dehumanizing because I keep using the word stakeholder, but I'm trying to, you know, just as a global term for the human beings who can influence our efforts. Um, and by influence, either they influence the implementation and or they benefit from our implementation efforts. And so we need to identify all of those individuals and where they kind of reside within our conceptual world um, related to each of our studies. So whether we call an outside community the outer setting or the inner setting <laughs> um, will completely depend on where I'm standing. So um, the work, the upfront work of conceptualizing and articulating your world is really important and then being consistent and true to that throughout. So often, the big challenge is not so much assessing the constructs within the CIFR. The challenge is where the heck are those lines? And I may have multiple inner settings. And I, and what about teams within those inner settings? Um, like if I'm looking at a hospital, which is you know obviously a clinical setting, uh, there, there, there's a pediatric ICU, there's medical ICU, there's surgical ICU, and now we have ICUs for COVID patients and negative pressure. And, you know, we have all of these different entities that can have very different contexts. So are each one of those an inner setting or is the hospital as a whole the inner setting? So I think that, you know, you begin to imagine these kind of concentric circles where again, the boundaries may be somewhat porous and complicated, but in order to find a clear path for yourself, you have to pencil those lines in and then uh, conceptualize or have your kind of your own theories about which constructs and how to characterize it as inner and outer. We have one study where we're, we're conceptualizing settings as inner and outer. So we've got one strand of work, like on one aim, where um, the individual uh, hospitals are, you know, the inner setting. And then we have another strand, another aim, where the system executive leaders are actually the inner setting and the hospitals then are kind of, you know, outer influences, so to speak. Um, which may not make sense on the surface, but when you're deeply into it and trying to figure out, you know, how are all these factors inter interleaving, um, it begins to make sense. <laughs> Great. Um, so I think we have time for one final question. And uh, so this question is, so let's say you've selected the constructs you're going to prioritize. So you've you know, you're using the CIFR, you've selected your constructs, but what happens if you choose poorly? Ooh, we've done that. <laughs> Going back to that first open question and eliciting the story is really important. So with the TLC project, in fact, we went through that kind of, what are the constructs that are most important with our operational partners who had a lot of experience working with these medical centers but they didn't work in those medical centers actually. They just knew you know, over the years, all the questions, all the challenges with program implementations in the past. So together they gave us input and we decided what were the, most, the 12 most important constructs. There ended up being, um, I don't know, three or four constructs that we had to add to the list and then three or four that we took off the list because they just never came up. So two things, one is, it's important to um, uh, plan your interviews with people who are most close, most knowledgeable of the implementations that will be taking place. So usually this is a champion or we have another term separate from a champion, but sometimes those two roles kind of combine um, into whoever the implementation lead is. They've either been pointed to saying, you're going to do this mandated, you know, or 
they've really volunteered for it. But regardless, that point person, that main point of contact um, should be among the earliest interviews. And then as a team, pausing after those initial, those first interviews and coding those passages. Are we on target? You know, do we have the right set of constructs? And if we don't make those adjustments early so that you're then rolling out with the rest of the site. So we knew that there was some mismatch. You know, we had good overlap with our Venn diagram, but there were some uh, refinements that we made to the interview guide. And we were able to do that early enough in the process. And from then on, I mean, it was smooth. It was, it was good. We, were, we knew we had it. <laughs> Laura, I was going to say also that this is the importance of, this is why we do those very small tests of change. You know, right. you don't invest heavily in an area where you could be right or wrong, but a small test of change, that process aspect, again, helps you know that you're on the right track. Right. I think you're muted, Rachel. Or Felice. It's okay. That was really great. Um, I see we have three more minutes. So I'm trying to see if there's any we can get done really quickly. Um, so we'll just pick this one because why not? Um, so how do you choose the C for domains for the qualitative interviews initially? Um, again, you know, the, the domains, um, the, this is a, this is a, a similar question. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we really need to have some level of nascent developing knowledge of the context, the scenarios in which we are implementing. So, you know, let's say you are you know, a US researcher who is implementing a program in Nigeria, we may not know a lot. I know I would know next to nothing about the context and the challenges within Nigeria. How do I, like, where do I even begin? Well, you know, one thing is I need to do a lit review and find out what other implementations have gone on in Nigeria. Um, I would hope that I would have operational partners e at the governmental level, at the clinical level, at the community level, whoever those people are, I need to become best friends with them. And they are a really key source of that preliminary information. And this is where the participatory facet of our work is so important. I have theories, I know abstract concepts, but I know nothing about Nigeria. I would need to work with people who are knowledgeable and live in the settings within in Nigeria that I'm not familiar with. And they really are leading the way on what is important. And again, you know, we may both together miss the mark in the early phases. But it's very important to do that information gathering and then to be ready to refine and adapt. Well, I'm, I'm not going to say adapt. I'm going to say refine and fix your strategy or your data collection as you go. Thank but you. You really, you really need to build that preliminary information to guide that decision. Thank you. OK, I think so we've I now hit the um, Say thank you. A huge thank you to Laura. That was just really fantastic, very, um, it was just a wonderful overview to how to put all of these things together. So uh, we are now going to the break and Mondira,